Man, what a great, great Mother's Day. You guys are looking great. Come on, everybody. We have an exciting day for you this morning. I thought, you know, I could preach, but what would be better is to talk to my mom, Brenda Baba, and right. Whitney's mom, Vicki, and so we're so honored and glad my to girl have Kelly, them here. My girl Kelly did an amazing job in the game. But sister still got her mic in her hand, and I needed her to bring it onto the front oh, so oh, I can oh. give it. <laughs> Good job, girl. Good job. You did it, Mama. You're so great. Kelly. Thank you so much. Those spicy senoritas tried to steal our microphone. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Man, so good. What a fun, fun day. Hey, Mom, happy Mother's Day. So glad, so glad that you're here. Vic, all the way from the great uh, state of Oklahoma. Yay. Glad that, glad that you made it. You made it here. Uh, we, we've got some flowers for you guys. So these uh, beautiful arrangements will be going home with you guys. So thank you for all that, uh, all that you've done. Yes, for everything. we got it. We're ready. I love it. No, it's an incredible day. And we're excited to get to share some wisdom and some love from the two of you. You know, I remember all kinds of stories growing up. And as a little kid, uh, Me too. I would always. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Oh, man, it's going to be one of those days for me. I already, I already feel it. And so I think we've got some photos of us, of us growing up yes. uh, when we were young. There's, oh, look at that. So cute. Dude, got the little, uh, the little top. Oh. oh, there we go. That's when it started going downhill. Okay. <laughs> what is that? Okay, there's a little baby Whitney. It's cute. Okay. Who cut your hair back then, I Whitney? I don't know. I don't know, Mom. Vic, was that, did Come you give on. me that haircut? It was cool in the 80s. Oh, cool, okay, okay, okay. I think that's the, that's the bowl cut. That's the bowl cut. The bowl cut. No, yeah. It, it, those are great pictures. I love looking at old pictures, reminding us of the seasons of life from long ago. Yeah, and so it's fun to just look back. And like yeah. Rachel said, we know that Mother's Day for some of us can be a heavy day. Yeah. But the truth is, whether you had a good mom or a rough mom, you're in a new season and you get to make those, those next decisions. And as we were talking about the theme of one tough mother, that like this is who we believe that the women of more church are called to be tough mothers, that it doesn't just mean you're strong and, 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 and gruff and tough and intense, but what does it actually mean? What does it actually look like to be a tough mother? And the truth is, as we talked about it, we decided these are two of the greatest, toughest mothers yeah. we've ever known. Yeah. I mean, clearly they put up with the two of us yeah. our whole life, but they have all that it takes to be tough mothers. And we wanted to share some of their wisdom today. Yeah. You know, a good mom has the ability to be tough and tender. That's right. It takes both of those pieces to raise to raise children. Absolutely. And so we kind of named the day after y'all, One Tough Mother. That's right. Because that's, right. that's what I had. And so <laughs> just to kind of start the morning off. That's good. Was there ever, uh, Vic, I guess I'll start with you. Was there ever a time when Whitney was growing up that you just wanted to strangle her? Like she just drove you half crazy. <laughs> well, first of all, let me say, I raised girls. And so I don't know how to raise boys, but I understand they're a little tougher. But I really had a good daughter. Um, she never, I never wanted to strangle her, but there were some times that um, I got a little stressed or a little anxious about a situation. Um, I remember when she was about three years old, um, she was three years old actually, we had just brought her baby sister home, she was probably three or four days old, and as typical, um, when you get home from the hospital, there's things you need, right? Right. Because you've been gone for a few days. So dad left and went to the store, left us alone. My dad calls me from, uh, we were in Georgia, and he called me from Oklahoma on the phone. So that left Whitney somewhere in the house. And so all of a sudden, I look across the den floor, and here comes Whitney. And I was thinking, what Cabbage Patch doll is that that she's holding? And all of a sudden, you're already there, right? All of a sudden, her, the little legs started moving. And so I questioned her. Of course, I said, oh, darling, let me help you. Um, and so I um, tried to maintain, t maintain my control, and I kind of asked her what happened. But basically, we had a bassinet in my bedroom, which was about nine stairs up on the second floor. So Whitney had gone in. I don't know if Emily had cried or what, but she had gone in to take her baby, and she held her out to the hall, sat down, and scooted down the stairs. <laughs> and walked across the floor. I've always been resourceful. And so she, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
And she's always been a helpful child. She's always been a helpful big sister. But thank God he was with her and with Emily during that time because I asked her to go grab a diaper for me after that and she ran across the den floor and fell down. So I'm thankful that happened later. Now, next time I see Emily, I'm going to tell her, Emily, now we know what happened. Maybe she dropped <laughs> you down the stairs. <laughs> now, Brenda, I imagine you might have a few more stories. Well, you pick or a times year. Where pick you a year. Pick a year. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. He, trust him, he was, he, was a good, he was a good child. He was out of the box, and you had to keep up with him. In fact, you had to stay ahead of him. But there were a, a few incidents, and, and I would say probably say three-year-old, 10-year-old, and around right after he graduated were the tough years were, and I look back and they were times that he was trying to be independent. And, and so uh, I kind of had to straighten that out in a couple times. <laughs> uh, one time when he was in the fourth grade, he was 10, 10 years old, and uh, he was fussing about something, you know, the way home was, and he was making comments about you know, other people don't do this, my friends don't do this, uh, you know, other houses, families don't do this, I should live someplace else. And I says, well, I'll tell you what, go get your coat. Let's go for a car ride. And he didn't know what I was going to do. And so I, get, I put him in the car, I tell him, you get in the car and we're going to go for a truck car ride. We go several streets over, we lived in a subdivision, but we went several streets over to another neighborhood. And I says to him, okay, and I drove real slow, pick a house. Where do you want to live? And he was like, Look at Jonathan's face. And now he's like, and you know, he was like, I, you know, but I was scared to death because I thought, what if he actually picks a place? How am I going to explain this to this house? And are they going to call somebody, you know, and take him away or something? So thankfully, well, I would go by and I'd say, You want to live in that house? I bet that they don't buy you this. Well, you do this, I bet they don't tuck you in bed at night. I bet, you know, all, I bet they don't have nice dinners like you have. And, you know, I named all this stuff, and he give up. And, you know, he never did that again. Yeah. <laughs> never had to get it again. And so, yeah, and so then when he turned 18, uh, he had graduated from school, and um, he, uh, he was another time where he... Well, he was working at Sears, and he was making real good money. Uh, he was selling tires, and I think he's talked about that before. And he he sold commission, and you know he could, he was like you could sell snow to Eskimo. You know that's kind of how he how kind of how he is, and uh, because he had all this wad of money, that of course he didn't owe nothing, and he didn't pay in anything. It was all his. So help me, Brenda. You know, this is good so, wasting. So anyway, I said to him, I had kind of been on him about cleaning his room because I was kind of a neat freak, and I am to this day. But I said, clean your room, clean your room. After about four days of this, I says, Tarson, get in there and clean your room. Well, he had something else to do. And that just ticked me off the wrong way. I went to the garage, and I got me four big plastic black garbage bags. I went to his room, and he didn't know what I was doing. I loaded everything up I could put in those bags, and I was as mad as a hornet. He says, Mom, what are you doing? Mom, what are you doing? And I says, I, you doing clean your room? I'm going to clean your room. So I took him to the front door, not realizing at the time we had a lawn service. And here they are in their mowers going back and forth, back and forth. And I didn't care. I threw the garbage bags out the door and one and two and three and four. And, and I shut the door and I said, you want them, you go get them. And that was the last he ever did that, too. So that, <laughs> I love it. I didn't it. get like that very often, but... <laughs> it's so good because as we're parents ourselves, right. and for me, like, I'm looking at my two in the front right here because they're that age right now spreading their wings. And so I love that wisdom of, like, sometimes you still got to rein them back in even when they have their own independent... Yeah. You got to help remind them and put them in their place. Yeah, and if you've got an out-of-the-box thinking child, sometimes I love that. you might have to do something that can potentially get you arrested. And, you know, you have to do something <laughs> a, little, a little crazy. As my mom was telling me the stories that she was thinking of sharing, I was like, you've got a lot of these, mom. <laughs> <laughs> we did some crazy, some crazy things. Okay, yes. so to be a, a great mom, to be a right. tough mother, sometimes you have to be tough with your kid. And yeah. so, Vic, was there a time that you had to be tough with? Yeah, 
Yeah. Whitney? Um, like I said, raising girls is a little different. There's different issues we may address. Um, I just remember um, one of the toughest things for me, because as girls we had fun. We had party, you know, tea parties. We got makeup, all the fun stuff. But there were times that I had to be tough on them and say, okay, this is what we do in our house. This is what you can't wear. Um, no, you can't go there. No, you can't go with them. Even though they were good church kids, they may have been three or four years older, and at the age they were at, it was like, no, this is not what we do. And so I had to set some boundaries, um, just some house rules that we did, like this is what our family does. And sometimes that was hard. I did, I did it without disrespecting any other mothers for the choices they, they allowed their kids to have. It didn't have anything to do with them. It had to do with our family and, and our standards that we had. And so it wasn't always easy, but it was just something that I had to do. Oh, I remember um, uh, any of you old school uh, uh, people who grew up in church, like I remember the fight to wear jeans on a Sunday night. And I remember my mom saying, uh, I grew up in a pastor's home. And what I always appreciated was that it was never because we're pastors, this is what we do. But it was because I grew up, my maiden name is Taylor, because we're tailors, this is what tailors do. This is our rules, our standard for our home. It's something we've implemented for our family too, because that pressure, right. it, can be, it can be tough to decide how to help them see what you said is great, that we're not disrespecting anybody else. Yeah. It's just for our house, how we're doing what yeah. we do. Right. Yeah. I love it. No, sometimes you have to be tough uh, with your kid and say, this is how we do it in our home. Yeah. You live here. These are our rules. This is what, what you're yeah. going to do. I love that. And then, Mom, I think not only were you tough with me, <laughs> but I remember a bunch of times that you were tough for me. Right. That you would protect me. And so talk about that. Right. Um, you know, he, when we'd go to parent-teacher conferences, we pretty much agreed with the teacher a lot of times. But, <laughs> I mean, I was <laughs> You're doing I mean, good, buddy. But, you're doing good. Let me tell you. I, did, I mean, because, you know, I knew how he was, and I knew how I was, and... We like to talk and all this other stuff, and so I got it. But um, when, if there was somebody that wasn't saying it right or doing it right or wasn't handling things right, I made sure to step into the situation. And I didn't get in. I didn't get into people's business and their teaching and stuff like that. But one day he come home and he said to me, "Mom and Dad, we were sitting at the kitchen table, and he said, there's this kid at school that wants to fight me, and I don't want to fight him.'" And I says, well, what do you mean by that? And he says, well, he's threatening. He's, he's getting people to take, like, bets and stuff like this. If I understand, he was like a skinny, scrawny kid, wasn't he? And I think he wanted to I had a lot him. of fights, Mom. I don't, I don't remember all the... <laughs> it, anyway, he, I think it was just daring him. And I said to him, well, I said to him, all right, you want to fight him? If he fights you, I don't want you to fight if you don't want to fight. But you want to fight, you make sure you knock the snot out of him. <laughs> And, and you win, and you win. Now, Jonathan didn't agree with that. And so I said, to, I, I said well, I'm going to call the principal. And he said, don't call the principal, cause trouble. And so I didn't care. I called the next day, and I told the principal, I said, this is what's happening, and I want you to know I've given my son, Trust and Baba, the, the, um, the permission to knock the snot out of this kid. <laughs> And, and, he, and that's what, and well, Mrs. Babba, you can't do that. You can't say that. Oh, yes, I can, because you have to protect him. He's there. I'm not there. His father's not there. You have to protect him. And that was taken care of. There was never a fight, was there? <laughs> not that she knows <laughs> of. Uh, this was uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, a little different world. But I think the idea is, is that you came in and there, I found myself in a situation right. that I couldn't right. handle yeah. right. properly. And so you had to be tough for me to come in right. and create, create and some And I boundaries. was always, I mean, I was for him and I would discipline him. Um, but I would protect him. I mean, yeah. and, and, I, and I stood up for him. I mean, we all, no, yeah. That's what we do as moms. As we were talking this week, what I thought was great is, yeah, we were, we were different kids. Mm -hmm. um, I was more the rule follower and the, like, like maker. yeah, how, yes, how can I do it this way? Right? Wait, he was more outside the box. Uh, as you always say, a great kid, but more outside the box. But you both That's had, how we clean it up for Sundays, stop. outside the box. That's how I clean I, it up. Your mom always says that. I've yeah. known her a long time, always, that he was a great kid. But what I love is, is that uh, you both found ways to put tough structure in our life yeah. because you knew that even a rule follower 
was going to find ways to drift off course. But you also knew that you had to be tough for us. He was tough enough for himself, but you were tough for me and you were tough for him, right. even though we both went different ways. So no matter your kid, no matter their personality, we're, there's still boundaries and guard rules to be tough with them. Yep and to be tough for them. And yeah. I think that really and truly, we joke and tease, but the kids we've grown up to be today are because you both were so diligent to be tough with us yeah. and tough for us. 100%. And so thank you for that, yeah. but great wisdom for the people in the room. Yeah. Um, you know, as we pastor, yeah. we talk with a lot of families, and I know that there's a lot of moms in the room that are trying to be good moms, right. but are walking through some heavy stuff themselves. And so, there can be tough seasons to, to navigate. Yeah, I think you guys became such great tough moms because you faced your own tough circumstances. Brenda, would you share some of your tough season, what it meant to you, how it helped you, what you learned from it? I would say um, as far as raising trust, and it probably uh, junior high, high, high school was kind of difficult, and it was because of what Jonathan and I were, it was what all three of us were going through. Uh, when Tristan was three years old, Jonathan had gotten sick and um, had been sick for many years. And it was just during those early, during those junior high years into high school, um, it put more pressure on me. I had a business. I had, it seemed like I had to make everybody happy. I had to make employees happy. I had to make customers happy. I had to make Tristan happy. I had to make Jonathan happy. I had to make the house. I had to make family happy. I had to make everybody happy. And I felt I got lost someplace in there like is Brenda going to be happy not that I was so important but it's just like you kind of lose yourself you lose what your hobbies are you lose what you know like what you used to like you got so involved into taking care of everything that was just really hard so I would say and then along with that came guilt and fear am I doing this right and the guilt of did I pay enough attention am I doing all this stuff I need to do and I and that kind of hounded me for a few years, and it's just like I, I did it, you know, and I was happy at doing it, but, I, but there was a part of me that was missing that uh, took a while to figure that out. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's true, and I know you take, face tough seasons for you as well. Yeah, for me, um, it happened a little bit later. I had uh, two adult children and one daughter at home in high school, and I was married for a long, long time in ministry and then went through an unwanted divorce. And that was tough for all of us. Um, when he was here, my other two were in Tulsa. And we were all trying to figure out how to move forward in life in a positive manner. And I remember one morning, my youngest daughter and I were getting ready for church. And she was just frustrated. And as people do, getting ready for church for some reason, uh, what to wear, whatever. And she sat down and said, I do not want to go to church. I just hate my life. And because of the brokenness and the hurt that we had incurred, I understood some of what she was going through. There was times I didn't want to go to church either. I didn't feel like it. But, but I knew that I had to um, be the example. And anyway, when she did that, it just kind of hit something in me, in me. And you have a choice to make of which direction to go. And so I just rose up and said, you do not have to hate your life. Um, you know, we will get through this. We will not be defeated. And I was not willing to give in to what could happen otherwise. And so um, I just said, we will rise above this. We will be okay. So I was just trying to snap her out of it, which didn't happen automatically. But I can tell you, we went to church, okay? And that was the one thing, all I knew when all of this stuff happened and our life started to change, all I knew was God. All I knew was keep doing what you know. We went to church, and so I couldn't help them, but I knew that God was bigger. He was bigger than our pain, and he could help us. Really good wisdom. I remember uh, not long ago, my brother-in-law said to me, because uh, I have little nieces and nephews that are little guys, and I remember he said, you know, um, one day I will tell my kids about what I watched in the faithfulness of their Grammy in that season. And moms and dads in the room, you may not recognize that what you're doing is being paid attention to. But in that season where you were just trying to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you still were faithful and consistent to be in church, to serve God, and to point us, yes, to Jesus. 
There's a lot of things you could have pointed us to in that season, but all you knew was Jesus is the one that will get us through. And what I love, yeah, it's good. It's such good wisdom. What I love is that even though you didn't realize it, you were making an impact on my brother-in-law's life, on our kids' life, on your grandchildren's lives. And so the two of you, I think, when I look at the two of you, I see consistent, faithful women who have always pointed us to Jesus first. And I know, Brenda, you've been in seasons that were heavy and hard, but no matter what, you told Trustin, we're going to church. Right. I mean, the one thing that got me through the, all of this, I mean, there's a whole lot of detail that's left out of it, but the thing is that, is God, I just pray to him. I don't know how people do it, uh, raising a family that don't have God in their life. And uh, we did. We pointed, we pointed God to him. I mean, he's the answer to everything. I took time before work every day to talk to God. And it was through that time with him that I had that relationship and that grew over the years, which gave me more confidence to handle more things. I, that relationship with God is so important. And we, Jonathan and I, both have strived to teach him that relationship with God is so important. And um, we, there was times that you know, we wondered if he was doing it right, and I would go into his room at night, and he, he didn't know this, uh, but I, I'd just stand at the end of his bed and pray over him, that, you know, Lord, watch over him, take care of him, give him wisdom, give Jonathan and I wisdom for what we're trying to teach him, you know, help him to remember the good times and not the bad times, because it was a lot of good times. Trust, don't get me wrong, I tell these stories, but he was a good kid. He was a happy kid. He was not a malicious kid. So there's a big difference in that, you know. So uh, we had a good time. But, um, but we prayed that he would become the man of God, that God wanted him to be, and that we would, as parents, would realize that and handle things right. So, so good. So good. Mom, you talked about the hard times, the, mm -hmm. the heavy times. And so, like, what would you say to a mom that's here that's in one of those heavy, hard kind of external circumstances, but still have a kid at home that's, mama, 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 you know, feed me, take me to school, buy me something on Amazon. Like, mm -hmm. how, did you, <laughs> how did you navigate, like, you in all that and, and the master? What would you say to them? Well, I would say, um, when I was 15, I gave my heart to the Lord. Before that, I was a crazy wild uh, girl. For the 60s, I was born in 58, but I grew up in the 60s, and that was a crazy time. And I remember that I asked the Lord shortly after I got saved to um, never let me forget what I went through because I, I didn't know how many children I'd have. I mean, I wasn't married. I was 16. I wasn't married. Uh, 15. I didn't have children or anything. But I knew that probably one of them would be a lot like me. And so I didn't want to forget what I had been through and the feelings I felt as I was going through those times of rebellion or just strong-mindedness because I wanted to know how to relate to them. I wanted to know how to discipline them. I wanted to be able to remember that there's going to be a good end here, and I had a future for my child five years out, ten years out. I had to look ahead instead of just at the moment. And to this day, he has honored that. He has honored and reminded me over and over again how I felt then to know how to to deal with that, and my grandchildren too. So it's not just one generation. It goes into other generations. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. I think that that is the tenderness yeah. that it takes to be a tough and tender mom, to be really one tough mother, to say, hey, I'm going to be tender before the Lord mm -hmm. so that I can be tender before my child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and as I have known you all these years, that that is who you truly are, that that deep in your heart, you are so tender towards the voice of the Lord. And it's made it so that there are times I've heard, I've heard a lot of the trust and stories of life. <laughs> and I, as a mom of a boy, am like, oh, I would have been like, no, this is how. And your response was always tender because you were meeting him right where he was. Mm -hmm. And so rather than stifling the gifts in him, rather than saying, this is the box and you better get in it, you, because of the life you lived, you, you asked God, that's such a great wisdom to remind you of where you were, that then allowed you to be tender enough to parent him in a way that helped him stay outside the box. Mm -hmm. So that this church is a church that's outside the box. <laughs> yeah. 
And, so. and we don't realize, yes. They say that phrase that the days are long, but the years are short. Right. And on those long days, it's, it's long sometimes. I, I remember, Mom, you talking about how you had to study me. And like now that I have kids, Rachel and I will look at them and think about what they're doing or saying, and we take some time to study, like, okay, this, this one's personality. Yeah. What do we, you can't handle everybody the same. Right. No, I, no. Uh, because, uh, for instance, Lillian and Titus are two totally different right? people. How you would handle Lillian, well, you would not handle Titus. And that's the same, actually, it'd be like you. You wouldn't handle, you yeah. would not, it'd break you. Yeah. And you would run <laughs> And, and you would run wild because yeah. that's what I would have done. And that's the thing. You have to know your child. You have yeah. to know that, that one of them will run you as far as take you to the end. Right. But there might be another one that won't do that. And yeah. you have to do it in love. I don't know if I, and I threw the stuff out the front door and I was mad about that. But I mean, I never really did anything. I never spanked him out of anger. I never yeah. did. I mean, you got angry. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I spank you out of anger. Yeah. <laughs> I just spank you out of I I'm, did tell him to go get the switch out of the yard and pick the stick and I'll use that. I, yeah. yeah. We did that. But, we did that too. I remember. Yeah. yeah. No, it's so good. I think that like you're saying, no matter who and how your kid is, you have to be tender. Mm -hmm. That my middle sister, the one younger than me, was more like trust in Emily, the one I carried down, and it's probably because I dropped her down the stairs, who knows. <laughs> but she was the more testing one. She was the one that pushed the limits and pushed the boundaries. But we all have seasons where our kids push the limits and push the boundaries. And I know you have a story of being tender even in a time when I was starting to push boundaries. Right, right. Well, our tendency, like she said, in discipline is one to just say, Here's, here's what's gonna happen. Give me your keys, give me your phone, here's the grounding, uh, get in the box. But with each child it's different, of course, and with Whitney, one thing I wanna interject is that with Whitney, um, she was always a kid, uh, you probably know, she likes to talk, we both like to talk, but at night, she was the kind of kid who would say, mom, come lay down by me. This was at five, it was at 10, it was at 17, and we would sit and talk at night, and it was just, I'd crawl in bed with her, we'd just lay there and just talk, she'd just tell me all the troubles of the day. Like she said, my other, other daughter, middle daughter, she would never tell me anything, and then all of a sudden, three months later, there was an explosion, and I heard everything and every child that ever hurt her, you know, so they are different, you had to handle it differently. You have to assess what to do with discipline, but based on their personality as well, and depending on the situation. So one time I remember in high school, um, when he was in a school where, um, where you could go off campus for lunch in high school, but you had to have a, a permission slip from your parent to and take to the office to say that it was okay for you to do that. And so, um, one time I was in her bedroom cleaning the floor, and I mean cleaning the bedroom, and I found a note on the floor. So now I'll just tell you as a mom, if a note is on the bedroom floor and you're having to clean found the bedroom. Found a note in her bedroom. <laughs> then if you're cleaning her bedroom, then you have the right to look at the note. If you're paying the mortgage, you have Absolutely. a right. That's true. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, and now mind you, let me just tell you another thing, a real good secret. Um, I pray to God if there was ever anything I needed to know, anything that needed to be revealed about my children, especially when I felt something was a little off, I would just pray, God, expose that to me. Let me know what's going on. So this was one of those And moments. that Holy Spirit did it every <laughs> single time. I'm serious. Yeah, it's, Lee. It's, but anyway, I found this note, and I began to read the note, and the note, uh, I don't even remember who she's writing it to or who wrote it to her, but anyway, um, it, it exposed the fact that she had gone off campus without my knowing it, without me writing the note. Somehow her friend's penmanship was close to mine or something. But anyway, um, so she had got a, a note from someone else to take, and uh, she was able to go off campus to lunch with some boy. And um, Not so, Aaron. So I found... <laughs> I, I, Y'all coming at me all morning. I'm yeah. just going to say it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think, she, I think she was in 10th grade, and being an August birthday, she didn't have a driver's license yet, so she, you know, yeah. anyway, found somebody who would take her lunch, whatever. Whatever the reason was, it uh, didn't really matter, but I found out. And so I waited a couple of days on the weekend, then I, and I also wasn't quite sure how to handle that, you know? I, I wanted to scream and all that, but at the same time, uh, thankfully, when I found it, it was alone, so I could just cry out to God. But um, I 
decided just to, like, God, just give me wisdom. And I believe he did, even though it's a crazy thing that happened. But um, so I talked to her about it on Saturday morning. And what I had decided would be the thing for us to do, for some reason, I never read it in a parenting book or anything. It just came up. But I guess Saturday was cleaning day. Maybe that's why. But anyway, I decided that she and I would get in the shower and scrub the shower. Number one, the shower needed to be scrubbed. And number two, I had a captive audience. So we put our bathing suits on, we both got out of the shower, and we began to talk. And what I feel like I did, maybe I did it for me because I didn't know what else to do, but I also felt like this was a kind of an intimate moment that we could talk about this. We'd already had that relationship where we could talk about things. But this was an uncomfortable situation uh, and uh, disappointing for me and she knew I was disappointed but we were able to get in there scrub it out talk it out and just let me give her a little bit of wisdom of of what to do better next time and and why this wasn't the best choice to make yeah there's so much wisdom there because it wasn't just a you did wrong I'm gonna yell at you now yeah. you're grounded but instead it was like a side-by-side -side, shoulder to shoulder conversation yeah. because really what a good mom does or a good parent does is is gives wisdom is it's a gift wisdom to children is a gift and so sometimes it's not just laying down the hammer sometimes the hammer's got to get dropped but then before or after here's how it went wrong here's what you could do better and that shoulder to shoulder you know let's talk about it absolutely and it I, something Aaron and I say all the time that I, I, comes from what you just said is that the more you talk to your kids the more you talk to your kids and you said we already had that relationship and I know you and Tristan already had that relationship that, that it doesn't just start in a moment when they do something wrong that you can go, oh, now let's talk. Tell me what's going on. Yeah. But that's an intentional decision you guys made to talk to us since we were little. So that as we got in those older, trickier years, we would still talk to you then. Yeah. And I think that's so, such good wisdom. I, I was going to say that when he was young, at six months old, from six months old to probably about 13, we would have nightly devotions with him, um, read a story, have devotions, then we let him do that after, after he got older. But the thing is, is what, that opens up a communication there because you talk you know, about what God thinks or what this person did in the Bible or what's going on in your life. It's a perfect way to find out how your yeah. child's thinking and what's going on in their life and then how to interject your... Um, wisdom and right. your way to help them out and so that's that that helped him out a lot helped me out a lot helped our relationships and how to get to know him better and where he might be um, needing help at or something yeah. it's just a good thing and it might be uneasy to do that to start that but I'll tell you you'll your kids will see who you are and they'll see your heart and the love you have for them. Yeah. So you, you can't go wrong with that. You know, something we do every time. Yeah, come on, we can clap that up. <laughs> something that we do every time we do baby dedication is we give those families a kid's Bible. And so Rachel and I read that to our kids every night for years. Mm -hmm. And then just about a year or two ago, we graduated Titus to the Action Bible. And it's basically a comic book but like of the Bible, it's thick. And so every night we read that. And I can't tell you how many times we'll be in a situation with Titus and then we'll be reading the Bible story and we'll be able to say, you see what Gideon did? Yeah. He was afraid and hiding and look what's in your life and put those truths. It's not enough for our kids to know all the Avengers mm -hmm. if they don't know who David and, it's really good. you know what I'm saying? Right. And we're the ones that are helping to instill those truths. Yeah. I just wanna say one thing that during that time when we were done, we'd always pray. <clears throat> And the one thing we'd pray for, we'd pray over him, but we always prayed for his wife someday. We started that, and he must have been maybe four when we started that. And we prayed for Rachel, which is, she's Rachel now, we didn't know that then. And I'll tell you, God hears those, God hears those prayers. Right. He heard those prayers, right. he knew what was expected what we wanted to see in a wife for him, what we thought would be good for him. Good. And we carry that over now with the grandkids. When they come and spend the night with us every Saturday night, we are praying for Lillian's husband and Titus's wife, and they know that. Yeah. And that is setting them up for marriage success. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You have more wisdom that you'd like to share? Well, just one thing back to what she was talking about. Um, 
uh, talking with your kids. I think, um, just not to dwell on the discipline part a whole lot longer, but sometimes when we just push out a discipline really strongly and we go in our separate rooms or separate ways and we never talk about it again, sometimes a kid can get confused about what just happened. I did something wrong, but I'm not real sure that all this matches up. So I think talking about the situation, letting them own what has happened and let them... Um, even maybe help with the discipline. Sometimes I've heard, you know, people say, what do you think your discipline should be? And let them help be a part of that. But just, just to be able to help them to recognize what just happened. I just didn't throw out some strong discipline, but yes, this is what's wrong. Do you see why it's wrong? And then I like what you said, pray with them about it or show them scriptures to help them know why. Well, you know, as we were talking uh, this past week, I feel like that you guys set that precedent to talk to us because no one really talked in your day. It's something you kind of both shared with us, that yeah. in your day, things were just not discussed. And that you had mentioned, like, I walked through some fear and some guilt, but I didn't know I was the only one. And, like, I think that was such a, you guys had some great wisdom, so I'm going to just bring it up, and now y'all talk about it. <laughs> well, you want to go? I don't know. Yeah, I, don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, it just... I remember you said that you both found yourselves in a struggling seasons, yeah. but you felt all alone. And that well, part of the struggle, even in coming to church, was like, no one else has faced what I've faced. And that right. the culture here at More Church, we're just transparent, y'all. That's who we are. Right. But yes. how that godly community is part of what set you on the course of, like, Absolutely. talking about things. Right. It, it is. It was. If you had a problem with your kid back then, you didn't tell nobody about it. You wanted it to be a secret. You had a problem with your marriage. You didn't tell anybody about, it, anybody about it. It was a secret. And so the two of you had to suffer, or the three of you, or however many, the family had to suffer behind closed doors and trying to figure out with themselves how to fix this thing. Um, one thing was church attendance was such a big, big deal for us. Um, I can remember when Trustin was probably, uh, he was probably about 14 at one point, um, he, we were getting ready to go to church, and he wasn't up yet. And I told him, trust him, you've got to get up. It's time to get up, and like three or four times. And he, I come into the room, and I said, trust him, you have to get out of bed. You have to get in there, and you have to get breakfast. You've got to get, you got to, right now, you've got to do this. And he says, but I don't want to go. And you know what? I didn't want to go either. I had had, I don't remember what was happening in that week, but I just know that it, it was overwhelming. It was an overwhelming week. I didn't feel like going, and it was so easy. I was so close to saying to him, okay, we'll stay home. If I had stayed home, it wouldn't have fixed a thing. But I knew, because I knew how he was, I knew how I was, that if I said we're going to stay home, that's, that's going to come up again. He's going to say it to me again. And what am I going to say a month later? Well, you can stay home because he now he says, well, we got to stay home last month. And so I had to make a decision right then. And, I, you know, I got up, you kind of got bugged, and I said, trust and get out of bed. I'm giving you three seconds to get out of bed. If you don't get out of bed, I'm going to pull you out of bed, put you in the car with your pajamas, and go to church in your pajamas. You know, and he got up out of bed. But the thing was, Church attendance. Because I knew she would make me go wearing pajamas to church. Right. So I he was going to do. He was going to wear pajamas to church. But the thing is that attendance of coming regularly, he knew what was expected. Uh, and we stayed in the same church. We didn't go from place to place. I, I know that sometimes church people can be offensive. But um, I've been offended in church before. Not, you know, over, and I don't mean splits and stuff like that. I'm talking about sometimes somebody says something to you about your kid or about what you did or whatever. And I, the only thing I can say, to be honest with you, is get over it. <laughs> Sorry. Get over it. <laughs> you know, just get over, get over yourself, you know? Because he was more important to me than what that person said to me. Really good, Brenda. That's good. That's good. I wanted him to come. I wanted him to want to go to church. And if I'm scooping him up and taking him to the, I hope you don't mind if I say all this, and, <laughs> and scooping yeah, him okay. up, and Jonathan yeah. and I are offended, and we go to the church across, the, you know, across town, I have just separated from him from his friends 
and everything he knows. Now, I'm talking about a Bible-believing church that teaches the word of God. I'm not talking about some, something else other than that. But I'm saying I, there were times that Jonathan and I had just had to get over ourselves and forget it because he was who was important. He was the one who was going to carry the mantle of, the, of Christ in our family, the lineage, the lineage as life went on. And I wanted him to stay in the church when he got older. And so for us, that's just, that's just how we did things. That's what so it good. was. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, church attendance is super important. And I remember, like I shared with my daughter, not wanting to go. So there was times I was tired. I was doing everything on my own. There was times that um, I felt intimidated. I didn't want to go to church and see all those happy people. Like, why would I want to do that when I was feeling the way I was feeling? But um, I knew that church was important. I'd been raised in church, thankfully, and knew we were there every single time. The door was open, and even when it wasn't. And so, but, I, but it was a good habit that I, was, I formed. But it was also a thing that, um, that I say, put it on your calendar. Write it in ink. Do it as if you were going to baseball practice or to piano lessons that you pay for every month. Uh, you don't have to pay to come here, man. You just can come. And so anything that's important enough to put in your daytime or put on your phone, do a calendar event um, reminder, you know, whatever it takes, but make sure you're in church because it's so important. It's not just important for you. It's important for your kids. It's a habit you can form. doesn't matter what age your kids are. Start it now and let them know it's important. And that way they can keep it going. Because what I know is that the more you go, the more I went, uh, the more you go, the more you grow, the more your kids go, the more they're going to grow. All right, Vic, I see that alliteration. The more you go, the more you grow. Yeah, I have that capitalized in my notes. The more I like it. you go. I like it. The more you go. Yeah. Mom, we were talking uh, the other day, and you had talked about how, because of life circumstances and kind of some tough seasons, it felt like your dreams mm -hmm. shifted. And so what would you guys say to a mom in the room who, because of life circumstances or somebody else's bad choice, their kind of trajectory has shifted? Well, like I said, when Jonathan was three, when Trustin was three, Jonathan had gotten very sick. He wasn't able to work. Um, he had major surgeries, different things like that. And you know, as a young girl, you always have in your dream what your wedding's going to be like and what your family's going to be like, you know. And my dreams were changed, and I didn't like that. But um, I, just stuck, I just stuck with it. I just, I just stick with it. And I think that's the thing to do is just put God first in the whole thing and realize he is faithful. You can do this. You'll make it. And so with your kids, you just have to have your priorities straight. You have to, sorry to say, you have to put yourself in the back burner for a little bit. Not, not, through, the, not through the whole time and not for every situation. But the most important people in your life is your family. And you just have to kind of step back because pretty soon the time goes by so fast, doesn't it, Vicki? And they're gone. Absolutely. They're gone. I mean, when Trustin started school at the age of five, it was, he was, before you knew it, he was a senior. And he was gone off to college. And it does go, don't you think it goes by fast? It goes extremely fast. And I never believed it until well, I heard it. And then I'm experiencing it. It was like, oh, my land. But the kids are the most important and, and the way that you raise them. I used to tell him and Jonathan and I taught third and fourth four year old third and fourth grade Sunday school for years, but we tell trust in the most important decisions you'll ever make in your life are first accepting Jesus as your savior, second, who you marry, and third, we added later on, Jonathan, is how you raise your children. Because if you get those three things, you start with the Lord. It's true. And it doesn't make a difference where your kids are at in your life, how, how old you are, how old your kids are. Be an example today. I don't yeah. care if your kids are a senior today. Yeah. Be an example to them. Pray with them. And I know it's hard to do all that, to, especially something you're so weird. You know, it's something kind of out of the box to do that you've not done. Just do it. Just Good. do it. You know. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's um, sometimes easy to, to follow God when things are going well. We can praise Jesus and thank him for the many blessings it gives us. That's the right thing to do. We do need to remember to do it, to cry out to him even those times. But through the hard times, uh, we have a decision to make. 
Um, and so as I went through my divorce, I, I used to say I go back to that because it was one of the hardest times that I've had to walk through. Uh, I believe I've had a couple miscarriages, some other things. God's helped me through those things. But having to have my life turned upside down and me um, try to figure out what to do was a little tough. And so I, I kind of have a couple go-tos. I already said my biggest go-to is God. But... Um, I had told my kids that we all kind of were struggling with this. The kids were like, what are we going to do? Are you sure, Mom? All this stuff. And I was like, you know what? All I know is to follow God. And I know He's on the other side of the door. He's going to maybe have to tug us through it because we don't want to walk through there. But I want to stay as close to God to where I can feel Him brush against my cheek. I can hear His whisper in my ear. And the other thing I knew... Um, well, like she said, we think of our kids. So I wanted to help walk them through it. I could have screamed and cried. I could have gone a crazy animal person, I guess, um, you know, partied, whatever. But I knew I had to stay consistent with, with um, the example that I set. And mostly I knew I was broken. And so one of the things I know you guys talk about it at More Church a whole lot. Um, it's super important. But I wanted to go to a counselor because I knew my kids just might need a counselor. But I wanted to know who they were talking to. Well, guess what? I stayed. And I stayed for several years. And I went just, um, she almost became a friend because I felt like I could just share stuff. I had so much, like Brenda said, I had so many things I'd never shared with anybody. I had no one I could share it with. And so I was able to pour my heart out to somebody who was trained to get my head on straight, to learn to love me like I hadn't been loved before, to know that God loved me, that God wasn't super disappointed with the, with the things that had gone through in my life. And so I knew walking with him, finding wise counsel was extremely important. And I knew continuing to stay in church, to find what we call now our tribe or find our few people. I wanna speak real quickly to the single moms. I was a single mom when my kids were grown, I had a junior in high school, the other two were married, a little different than when you've got three little ones running around trying to figure all that out, that's a lot. But I wanna say to you, my hat's off to you, it's tough. I, I, it really is. Um, don't, don't let anybody tell you your job's not, not hard. I, I, help, I lead a single mom's group at my church and we meet every week. And so what I have found through them, the connections they have made is so important. I know this church supports you as well. They love you, but find someone. If you don't know someone, call these guys, call the office, whoever, and make a connection with another single mom. Uh, do play dates together, you know, find a babysitter together where you can get away, have coffee together, do a Zoom call late at night when the kids are asleep, but somehow take out some time to uh, connect with somebody else and know that you're doing a good job. God sees you, he knows what you're going through, he loves you and so does this church. We didn't even pay her to say that. <laughs> it's so good. I would just uh, like to add to that, which Vicki would agree, that there's not one person in this room who has done it perfect. Every single person in this room that's been a parent has made mistakes, yeah. but God. That's right. But God, that is what, he can take the crooked and he can make it straight. He can take the things you've said and the ways you've acted, and he can take our children and he can bend them and mold them and work it right, and you will see blessing after blessing out of when you think you've done it wrong, he'll make it right. Yeah, that's a great word. So good. That's a great word. Maybe maybe you were tender when you should have been tough, and you were tough when you should have been tender. Right. And maybe you got some stuff mixed up somewhere, but God can make the crooked path straight. That's right. God loves our kids more than we ever could. Yeah. It's true. And as long as we keep giving them to him, he's going to be with us in the process. That's right. Is there any last pieces of wisdom that you want to share before we go? Well, one thing is just relax, moms. You got it. Okay. And... Um, Nobody's perfect. If you ever read Proverbs 31 woman, you'll know that that's a high standard, but mostly that's a celebration of who we can be. And like you say around here, there's always more. There's more for us to be, but we do that through God's help and God's guidance. So continue to walk with him. Just that, that you can do it. You're going to do it. You're going to make it, and it's going to be okay. Just, just pray for your children and put God first, yep. and you can't go wrong. Okay.